We're going to start today and let's introduce everyone. So right now we are going to start with, uh, let's welcome Grammy, uh, Grammy nominee Miss Amethyst Kia to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. How are you doing, Miss Amethyst? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm a little a little tired. I came back from San Antonio last night, so I'm sort of still trying to grab get my bearings. But I'm happy, really happy to be part of the conversation. So, thank great, you. <laughs> awesome. So next, we are going to introduce Mr. Oh yes. So this is a fine thing about We're going to introduce one of my favorite artists uh, because how much work he has done with uh, National Museum of African American Music. And I'm so happy to introduce Mr. Don Fleming. Oh, how hey, you how you doing? I'm doing well. It's so good to be with you all. Oh, great. Awesome. Okay. Lastly, we're going to introduce... Uh, uh, one special great artist, uh, Haitian American, and she has done some amazing music in the roots field. Uh, and she's also been nominated for International Music Award nominee. That's pretty amazing. Uh, Miss Layla McCalla. How are you hey, doing, Miss McCalla? I'm awesome. doing great. Yeah. Sweet. Okay, so uh, we're here for a bright bar, um, a birthright recording, and so I think the main thing we need to remember is it's Women's Appreciation of Women's History Month, and we really want to recognize the work that African American women and specifically Black women have done in the recording field. So uh, there's been some amazing individuals that have been captured in this recording, uh, Miss Odetta. Uh, Ms. Staples. Uh, so my question is, how do you think African-American women have had impact in Roots music? And especially with this recording, uh, what is that, uh, how has that helped you in your career, Ms. Uh, Layla McKellar? Um, I mean, I always look to the stories of women because I am a woman and I'm trying to understand, you know, how to navigate, uh, I mean, personally, motherhood and building a musical career, um, two things that have always been connected and always um, kind of, I don't know, uh, always always in conversation of, uh, in, in a, trying to reconcile those two realities, you know? Um, like women have always been making babies and, and also always been making music. So how do you fit that into the social construct of our society, I think is the question that I ask myself a lot. And, and I look to women who have come before me um, on how they've navigated that. And, you know, the one thing that uh, always strikes me is like, you know, the, the health of a society is very much based on the health of its of what's going on with women in that society and so when it comes awesome. to the united states you know i think that in the uh, black community you know the health of black women has greatly you know has a, a great ripple effect on the health of you know family units or communities um and women are 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 always pioneers in that way, you know, regardless of which generation you came from or you're coming from, um, that is always, you know, uh, at the top of my mind when I, th when I think about um, how black women have navigated building, building careers and, you know, we're living in a different time where we're not like, necessarily you know most a lot of the music that i've learned from is from recordings i haven't sat at the heels of a of a master musician necessarily uh to learn this music and so i think that that's something that i i see that's different from the path of of women that have come before me 
Awesome. But I mean, I come like on, tea. man. You just asked me that, the first question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right I, I'm trying to dynamic here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little bit smaller question also because, <laughs> again, with Mavis Staples and also uh, one other person, Ed Baker, that was in this list, uh, sometimes they are underrepresented in music, but they've had such impact as far as their careers. Uh, so are there any other uh, women performers that have impacted you and your career specifically? I mean, I think about Nina Simone, uh, Miriam McCaba, Ella Fitzgerald, um, oh my God, Billie Holiday. And so, so many, so many women. Uh, yeah, those are the ones that, that come to mind immediately. Awesome. And of course, okay. I'm from Haiti, so I think of a lot of Haitian Haitian uh, women performan- performers, Toto Vicente, um, Martha Jean-Claude, also very obscure <laughs> in the Americana realm. Sweet. So, Ms. Amethyst, I'm going to throw that same question to you. Like, uh, one, women's roles as far as in the music industry, and also, can you name some women that have like impacted your music career also? Yeah, um, I think for me with with music, I think, you know, Layla made some amazing, amazing points. I think for me, um, like having, I think for me having the medium of the internet to learn about a lot of different things, that's how I learned how to play guitar, it's how I found, a lot of music and you know once I started studying old time music in school like again the internet and archives and how they're stored and access to things like the Library of Congress and all of those things like you know helped play a, a huge role in me being able to find you know different women and artists that were part of this. Um, I think for me the big influences were um, I definitely like Elizabeth Cotton. Um, and Etta Baker, her finger style playing, um, and really learning about how they and other women, like in their own life, you know, there's so many, there's countless stories of, you know, women who once they got married, they had, they had to stop playing music um, or they couldn't perform because they had to stay at home. Like there wasn't an option really to do both. And so um, I, I think I'm just incredibly grateful that you know, now there's, you know, through a lot of hard won fights, um, I and a lot of other women, we now have the capacity to, and the freedom to decide what we want to do. Um, there's still challenges. Um, as a person that I, I don't have children, so that's, that's one part of the equation that I've not even had to consider. And so, um, so I really, honestly, you know, between Layla and Rhiannon and, and Alice and Russell, um, looking at all that they've had to do and also, you know, take care of children and be mothers, you know, I, I think it's really incredible and inspiring um, that, that you all make the amazing music that you do despite all of that. And so I, I, think, I think it's really powerful um, when, when, you know, women have the, have had to have the capacity to wear multiple hats in order to, you know, achieve the things they want to achieve. And so, um, while that's also a very stressful thing, um, you know, I think it's, it's, again, it's inspiring. It's something that we can all kind of learn from. Um, and I think another per- person in here that I don't think was on this particular recording, but someone that I've been reading about a lot lately has been Sister Rosetta Tharp and kind of learning about how she had to kind of navigate herself through the music industry. And she always managed to like have a positive spin on things, be able to um, be able to maybe basically stick to what she wanted to do. She plays secular music. She still loved playing gospel music. Um, and the fact that, you know, she had to deal with things like she had to have a tour bus because she couldn't stay in a lot of hotels and the places that she was playing. She was playing 
front in front of thousands of people, but she couldn't even stay in a hotel. She had to stay on the bus. But she, in spite of all of that, still did what she loved to do. So I don't know, I think just seeing women, especially during the early part of the 20th century and the things that they had to endure, um, and, and so that I could do what I do today, I'm just really grateful that I'm able to do what I do and just, you know, how we can ever repay that, I don't know, other than to continue to have these discussions and, and just continue to recognize the contribution. So I think that's really important. Sweet. Okay, Mr. Don Fleming, I'm going to end that question with you. Well, for Women's History Month, it's amazing to be able to honor all of these amazing pioneers. You know, I had the great fortune of meeting Odetta back in 2007, and I had a chance to meet her about four or five different times. And for a woman that was able to take on the mantle of a very powerful folk singer like Lead Belly and to be able to adapt it to her own style, I mean, that's something that is uh, worth uh, celebrating every day of this month as well as every day of the year if uh, folks want to pull their Odetta vinyl off the shelf. But when I met her, she was so gracious and it was great to just be able to, at that time, she was such a well-known figure that most people just didn't take the extra time to talk to her. So I made sure to talk to her and, and spend some time and made sure she felt good wherever she was. And, and just, it, it, it's wonderful to know that she's being honored in this way. Um, Etta Baker, I, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to meet. But as I mentioned in my essay for Birthright, I... I I wanted to make sure that people understood that there are people like Etta Baker who didn't make commercial recordings early in their life, but as, uh, they, as they made their way into the folk revival of the 60s and 70s, she was able to carve out her own niche and then also was a National Heritage Fellow, which is uh, one of the highest honors that the United States government can give to a folk artist. So I wanted to make sure people knew that most of these artists... Um, there were artists that were not seen, but there were artists that were seen in their lifetime. And so there's a balance. And then there's also generations of history that uh, lead us to the present. So we have people like, um, you know, I'm not a woman myself, but I am benefiting from the power of these uh, pioneering artists, especially at, like Mavis Staples. I remember I got to meet her the year that I won the Grammy and I had the great fortune of seeing her win her very first Grammy for contemporary folk music. So it, you have a lot of these wonderful moments where you get to meet the artist in person. And then, of course, with Birthright, we're all bringing it together to galvanize it so that people can't say that it never happened. It's always been there. It's always been a part of us. It's always been a part of our uh, DNA as American musicians, whether we were aware of it or not. Awesome. So actually, I'm going to play on something that you commented on as far as birthright. How do you think efforts and projects as special as birthright can preserve that? The heritage of, the, um, of those efforts and also kind of promote and encourage other young black women for that next generation, similar to what Layla and Amethyst are doing. So can any of you uh, kind of see how efforts like this will help that next generation of bars? Well, of course, with an album like Birthright, there are two wonderful essays that started out. There's one by Mr. Corey Harris, and he goes into the holistic um, galvanizing of black roots music and how it reaches back to the to Africa, the African continent, and makes its way into the present. And in my essay, I decided to focus on the beginning of the black aesthetic of roots music, as shown through recorded music, because um, you know we, there's a, a a whole series of history that grows from how people are able to interpret and to be able to experience Black Roots music. Of course, we have to think of the early 20th century, the turn of the 20th century. There were uh, records that were accessible to people. So Black Roots music had to either be performed live or you had to hear it from uh, people performing sheet music in a Euro classical style, which sort of uh, makes it one step removed in a certain type of way. 
But after you started to have um, folklorists like Howard Odom, I mentioned specifically in the, the essay around 1908, he's bringing a wax cylinder around and he's trying to capture the sounds of black musicians that are in his neighborhood compared to uh, artists like the Fist Jubilee singers who, who performed in a very Euro classical style African American music. So just breaking those sort of pieces of history down so that uh, younger folks can understand that even if they they don't see the artists as the very first thing brought up in conversation, there have been many artists that have recorded and have paved the way for us in the 21st century right now. And so that's something I wanted to break down because you have to imagine that for the when you start having people like John Lomax asking the regular person on the street about their music or they find a tradition bearer that knows a lot of different music, they can, you know, they can now have a person speaking for themselves instead of being shortened or sweetened by whatever other um, powers that may be. And that's something that I think is really important for young folks to understand, especially because we take uh, the commodity of a video or an audio recording for granted because it's always been a part of most of our lives. But at one point, that wasn't the case. And so you had to find that music wherever it might be. And so that's one of the things I tried to really convey in the essay. And for, of course, young black women, there's, there's such access to so much music. But there has to be a, a, a grounding of where you're coming from. You have to know where, where, um, you know, where people have been before and, and then where people can uh, chart out new territory. Of course, I think of Amethyst and Layla as being two wonderful women artists who I met very early in their careers and to see where they've been able to go with the knowledge that they've picked up along the way, I think it's just, um, it's amazing. It, it allows us to go into places that many people haven't ever gone before. Well, I, I just want to add to the conversation that I think that there's a, a number of shifts that have occurred in our um, collective consciousness. Um, one of them is the idea of, um, you know, what blackness is, what black American music is. I mean, there isn't American music without black people. <laughs> um, we all know that, but I think for, you know, that's a relatively new conversation, you know, and I, I credit my time touring with the Carolina Chocolate Drops and um, even just fostering conversations about the history of the banjo, um, you know, that that was not a thing prior to the Black Banjo Gathering of, you know, the early 2000s. Um, I mean, that, the, the community has just grown so much. Um, I also want to say that th the reason why these recordings are so, I think, important and these, these compilation projects and essays and conversation about this is so important is because people, you know, of our generation and... And, and before us and after us are always going to be curious about where they came from, you know, as, as African-Americans, Haitian-American, we are, um, we have a lot of questions about our, our origins. And I think music really kind of uh, serves as, as a guide for, for a lot of that kind of ancestral um, reckoning. Um, I think also just you know, the way that the record industry cha has changed, everyone is kind of lamenting um, the loss of the, the power of, of labels, but it has put in our individual um, hands so much more power for different ways to shape shift creatively. And, you know, when I'm songwriting, when I'm trying to generate new work, I'm, I'm listening to recordings, I'm listening to what people are doing. And so that, you know, it's just this well of knowledge that is so critical to progress, I think. Yeah, I think it's, it's so important to have context when it comes to playing music. Um, because for me, learning about the history of roots music and understanding how, how important West African influences were in country music, which I didn't realize prior. All I knew about country music what was, was what was playing on CMT, you know, when I was a kid. That's all I knew. You know, when it came to blue when it came to bluegrass, all I knew was 
you know, the Beverly Hillbillies and Deliverance. Like I just literally no knowledge about any of it. And so having that context, just it completely changed who it completely changed like my grounding as a musician and, 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 and it also gave me a uh, insight into all of the other music that I'd grown up listening to things that don't even seem related on the surface. Like, you know, listening to Nirvana or listening to any sort of like contemporary rock music, which is what was a lot of what I was listening to growing up. Like you could trace all that back to, you know, sister Rosetta Tharp, you can trace it back to the, and then to the, you know, the gospel church, you could trace it back to the fiddle and the banjo, like all of this is connected. And, um, and the more people can see, yeah, the more people can see the context of, you know, where, where they come from musically, um, the better. And, and just reading, you know, time and time again, over the years of, you know, different artists that just kind of slipped under the radar as far as being recognized for their contributions in, greater mainstream music because of segregation, segregating the music industry. I mean, the whole start of labels was, well, black people will listen to race records and white people will listen to hillbilly records. Like it's like it, like the whole idea of genres that is rooted in, in racism. So um, I think the more ambiguous all of the labels get, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I think it's great to not, be able to pin something down because it means that more and more people are realizing that like, Hey, this is music and this is how I want to express myself. Um, and it shouldn't be, um, your race or your gender or your sexuality shouldn't be like the, 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 shouldn't be the, the thing that determines what you should and shouldn't be listening to. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And and it's all, it's also about access, you know, when I think back on things like I remember when I first met Layla I, at the time, I had just bought a copy of Alan Lomax in Haiti. And I remember that seeing this young lady that was so interested in Haitian music and connecting with her Haitian American roots, I just flat out gave it to her. I, I, I think it was still sealed when uh, when I passed you that that <laughs> box set, Layla, because I knew that she had a journey that she was going down that I couldn't go down because I'm not Haitian American. And so there was, there's an extra connection she might have been able to make with it. And she did, you know, she recorded a few of the songs that are off of that box set. And I think one of the things is it's access. It always comes back to access because Mm -hmm. when you can understand use when you know that user generated data has been used since the early 20th century to create uh, labels and and different ways to interpret the music i mean then you have to think okay i'm the user how am i going to generate data for the 21st century and that's really what i i've done in a lot of my uh, careers tried to use what i know which is much more broad than just um, a singular idea of what music should be into something that can manifest in in a very different type of way or you know of course, um, I think of also Amethyst when I met her, I guess um, maybe around 2011 or so when she was in the ETSU band. She was, she was paving new way for even that band in, in a way that I think that um, the program uh, was, was changing to her more so than her changing to the program, which is something that is also <laughs> exciting as well. Because, you know, it gets people out of their complacency so that, you know, so that the music isn't in a rut, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, thank you. So now we're going to take it back to the reason why we're here, this uh, amazing <laughs> birthright of Black Roots on Music Compendium. So basically, I want to see uh, and get your interpretation of your uh, inclusion to the project, what you contribute to the project. We're going to start with you, Dom, with uh, base- the songs that I really like and, and that are really based off this was Polly put the uh, kettle on uh, and also uh, the chocolate drops, uh, Georgia Buck. And also, can you talk a little bit about your essay? Because people can get a really good understanding of uh, the background with your essay. Oh, of course. No, well, the essay, I'll start with that just to, to speak about that briefly. So the title of it is Celebrating 100 Years of Black Roots Music in America. 
And one of the things I wanted to talk about in my essay was it really to galvanize that over a hundred years, this box set is is uh, displaying, demonstrating, and it's validating music that has been uh, out in the ether. It's been it's been played in the field. It's been played in the classroom. It's been played out on the stage, and just really trying to show people how far all of these recordings reach back into our collective memory because there are some recordings of artists who made commercial records as with in race records during that era as amethyst mentioned before but then there are other artists like mississippi fred mcdowell who never made records until the 1960s and just trying to uh sort of uh, bring all of these aspects together because then of course there are a bunch of modern artists and Many of us have been influenced by these early recordings, whether they be the 60s or the, uh, you know, the 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, going all the way back. All of us have been in some way influenced by the environment in which we were, we were born. And recordings are a big part of that. You know, of course, there are people like Cedric Burnside, who comes from a, a deep family history of, of playing out in Mississippi. But even there, you have a moment where... Uh, R.L. Burnside, his his grandfather, was a person who met with Alan Lomax, made field recordings, and helped to galvanize Mississippi blues music in a way that now in the 21st century, it's just sort of, um, it's almost like it's a, it's almost a part of the building that that we're walking into with with uh, with black roots music. So uh, he's one of the cornerstones of of the the modern tradition in a certain way, and. So that's one part of the essay. So it, it's quite detailed into talking about the different facets going from the mid-19th century, heading all the way into the present, and really trying to also congratulate all of us on this compilation for helping keep the spirit of the music alive. So that's a bit of the essay. Uh, well, Polly Put the Kettle On is a perfect example of a song that started out as, um, in one ways, it's a, an English um an English play party song where kids would sing Polly put the kettle on back to each other. And it was sort of like a, I don't know, sort of like a duck, duck, goose kind of game. But when I first heard this song in a way that made me want to interpret it, it came from the recordings of the great Sonny Boy Williamson, the first John Lee Williamson. And however he ended up finding Polly put the kettle on and making a blues version of it. I don't know, but it really moved me musically. And so what I decided to do is I took the um, the Chicago blues style of that song, and then I changed it into more of a string band style of number. So I kind of picked up the tempo a little bit, made it more of a kind of a hard 2-4 instead of it being a broad 4-4 four, four sort of rhythm. And that was sort of how I, I came together with it. I feature a wonderful musician, uh, Ben Hunter on the fiddle, um, uh, Joe Siemens on the guitar, and the background vocals, and then, the, of course, the legendary Guy Davis, another person who's been an inspiration for me for many years on, uh, on the guitar and the vocals. So there was that one. That was on my album Prospect Hill. And then the, a real special track is the Carolina Chocolate Drops with Joe Thompson singing Georgia Buck. So when I was first asked to be a part of the project, there was a recording of Georgia Buck that had come from a previously released album, uh, a live recording that we did together as the group but for this one uh, back in 2006 I think right when after I made my way out to North Carolina and the later part of 2005 I met with Timothy Duffy over at Music Maker and I set up a recording session with the Carolina Chocolate Drops and Joe so uh, we could get all of Joe's repertoire down into uh, for posterity and we also get our arrangements that we had when we started to play with him. I wanted to get all that down on tape. And so it's a, it had been so many years since I'd listened back to this session, but this one Georgia bucket always stayed with me. And so what I ended up doing is I went back in the archives. I spoke with the producers and said, hey, you want a, a track that's never been released? And, and so they, they really jumped at the chance to be able to um, hear this new track that uh, one of the key parts of it was I wanted to have a high quality recording where you could hear all of the instruments. And so we have a beautiful stereo recording of Joe Thompson and the Carolina Chocolate Drops as we used to play it on uh, at the porch in uh, Joe's house many, many uh, 
Thursday nights. And so that's what that's what I wanted to do with that one. And of course, Joe sounds fantastic on it with a, a nice high quality recording. Um, and of course, myself and Rhiannon and Justin uh, doing our best to um, drive the music and, and show a little bit of what we what we had to offer. And so that's a little bit of that track as well. Awesome. So uh, before I continue asking questions, I also want uh, us to remember there's going to be time for questions at the end of uh, the recording. So you can submit your questions to roundtable at craftrecordings with the S dot com. So submit your questions to uh, our three amazing artists. And again, that is roundtable at craftrecordings dot com. So. Now we are going to kick it to Miss Amethyst. Miss Amethyst, can you talk a little bit about your contributions to this uh, amazing project? Yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, Pretty Polly um, is the one is the song that I was on. Uh, I played guitar and sang the song, and then um, my uh, band instructor from ETSU, Roy Andrade, was on banjo. And I feel like Pretty Polly is a really, um, a really great example of the Scots Irish and West African traditions coming together because there was a, a ballad tradition that came over from uh, the Scotch Irish area, um, and murder ballads were um, fairly popular to sing in Appalachia, and it was usually sang by women a cappella, um, and and a lot of these murder ballads, it was usually um, a woman being killed by a man in some form or fashion. Usually it was when a woman refused to be with the man, um, which is kind of, an, that's a whole other, I guess, interesting conversation to have. But, um, and usually like if the woman dies in the end, sometimes he goes to jail, sometimes he doesn't. It just depends on, you know, which version of the song, because there's usually multiple versions of the same song. And then the banjo being part of it is, is this where the West African tradition comes in. So you've got this very rhythmic, melodic, um, just beautiful sound, uh, Clawhammer style banjo underneath um, to kind of help carry the story along. So, in particular with that song, um, I went into um, the first time we ever played it was I was at ETSU and, um, you know, I brought, brought the song to the band to play. And at and also ETSU is East Tennessee State University. I don't know if I said that. Um, and it's in Johnson City, Tennessee, where I still live. Um, I went to the archives of Appalachia, which are in um, the Sherrod Library in Johnson City, Tennessee. And I was looking up like various versions of the song. And there was one version that came from, I think maybe came from Oxford, England. I'm not 100% sure now. Um, but there was, there was another tradition within ballad singing where some of the, some of the endings and some of the themes would be supernatural in nature. So I found this one version, it wasn't called Pretty Polly when I found it, but it was all of the same verses were there. Um, but the only thing that was different was at the end, um, uh, William is on his boat trying to get away because he had killed Polly and buried her in the woods and his ship crashes and he sinks to the bottom of the, the ocean and he sees Polly's ghost under the water and she has a baby in her hands and the baby's like covered in blood. Um, so like in the very end, like, and then he's like screaming as he's drowning, as he's seeing Polly's ghost and the, un and the unborn child. Um, and I thought, you know, that's probably the best possible ending you could get for something so terrible to happen to an innocent <laughs> person. So, um, so, um, so I added that to the end of the song and every time I would play it, you know, there was just, it was a verse that most people had never heard before. So, um, so it was, that was just, you know, one example of like only the power of what two folk music traditions 
can can create when they're brought together, but also um, the fact that there's just there's so many wonderful things to find um, in uh, there's so many wonderful things and versions of things to find that are out there, whether they're in an archive, whether they're online on online archives. Um, so it kind of also showcases like how important again archiving is because had that not been there, I never would have found that verse. So um, it's just it's just a testament to the importance of that and the ability to find things and have access to things. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, Miss Layla McCalla, I'm going to ask you about Money is King. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome contribution. So can you tell us a little bit about it? I think I actually, I learned about an artist, a uh, Calypso artist called The Growling Tiger, actually from Dom. Uh, I think we were listening to it in the tour van or something. And I was like, this music is amazing. And I had been uh, listening to a lot of Haitian music. I really had fallen in love with a particular style of Haitian music, was, which is called Troubadou. And um, it's basically the troubadours of Haiti. It's the hillbilly, ha Haitian hillbilly music. And um, a lot of the music is secular um, and really, um, you know, kind of incorporates fables and um, just stories about a Haitian people, people's lives, pe things that people are struggling with, a lot of political and social commentary. And so I, I discovered that music and I felt like I had hit a nerve, um, you know, within myself, just something that I really was drawn to, you know, and I, I still am drawn to music that is, you know, politically and, and socially conscious. And, um, and that's become a big uh, cornerstone of my, of, of what I seek, you know, what I seek to share and, and what I seek to listen to. And, um, and of course, you know, nothing is in a vacuum. So that, that particular style of music from Haiti exists in so many cultures in different ways. And so uh, I think the Trinidadian kind of manifestation of, of that music is Calypso. And the old Calypso songs are, are very much geared towards uh, social and political commentary. And so I was putting, I had written a song called The Capitalist Blues. And I was, ended up being the, the title to my third record and of examining the ways that capitalism is, you know, suffocating us all. And I, I still stand by that. But uh, Money is King just fits so well under that umbrella. And, um, and I, I love that song. I love that artist. I mean, uh, the growling tiger, Neville, Neville Marcano, uh, or Marsano, I'm not exactly sure how it's pronounced, um, what's his name. And, um, you know, there's, there's kind of like this, this, um, this tradition in Calypso music and Trinidadian music of like kind of posturing. So there's like the mighty sparrow and um, a lot of the Calypsonians have these names that are like very grandiose. And, um, and I just loved that. I loved that, you know, that kind of pride um, and, and awareness of, of what we have to be proud of um, as Caribbean people. Um, it just, it, it fits if it's well when you're trying to make music that feels, uh, you know, socially apropos. So um, that's where that song comes from and had a lot of fun recording it. Awesome. Okay. So, um, Miss Amethyst, you spoke earlier about country music and especially uh, the blending of different genres, or your background in alternative music, how Nirvana and different, uh, and also indie music has influenced you. Now, we have to recognize also how much uh, Black artists have influenced country music specifically. So uh, I know you have recently had your second time experience performing at the Opry, and um, that's yeah. really amazing. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of want to start with you, but how do you see like African-Americans' influence on country music and how has it lasted? Yeah, well, you know, I think, um, I think, again, I guess obviously we all can agree and know, like, the origins and how that 
has obviously always been an influence, but wasn't really readily recognized until, you know, I guess the past maybe 10 or 15 years, slowly but surely. Um, but even in contem- even as country music continued to like evolve and shape through the 60s, the 70s, all the way up until now, the styles of singing, the instrumentation, some of the rhythms were still inspired by rhythm and blues. So, so, so black musical influence has, has always and has continued and will always continue to be a part of that, regardless of the color, the, the shade of the face that's singing it. Um, I think a great, uh, there was um, a documentary that I was part of that was on, um, that was on Amazon, that's on Amazon Prime uh, called For Love and Country. And it interviewed me and several other uh, contemporary um, black country Americana musicians. And, um, oh my God, his name literally just escaped my brain. <laughs> oh, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll come to me. Breland, okay. And during yeah. Breland's interview was incredibly enlightening for me um, because he said that once he realized that, like, that once he realized that mainstream hip hop producers and mainstream country producers were both doing top line writing, so they would there would be beat that would be created, and then they would sing or write words over it. When he realized that it literally they were doing the exact same thing in hip hop and in country, he was like, "Well, let me give this a shot," you know, and so that was really enlightening to hear that because I, at that point I didn't really realize cause I hadn't been really listening to a lot of contemporary country music, but then I started listening to some more of it. And I was like, this is, this could be played on hip hop radio. You know, the only difference is that there's a twang in the boat in the voice. It's the only thing that I guess that would distinguish it alongside of, you know, the face of who's singing it. But, um, but again, that's, you know, once again, like that influence is there and, Again, I think it's I think it's really impossible, especially with American music, because of how everyone came here, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, everybody brought their music traditions with them. And it's just there's no such thing as a pure form of music, even when people try when there's people that try to say that, you know, there's pure bluegrass or pure old time music. It's like pure of what like what what purity are what what are we constituting as pure you know other than just because we see mostly white people doing it you know yeah right exactly and why why that's a thing so so yeah i mean i just think that like just the influence just just because of the nature of how american music formed like it's just it these different you know so-called genres of music just music the musicality of them they just can't they really can't be separated. And I think it's awesome. I think it's amazing. But I think, you know, again, it goes back to the visual. It goes back to marketing. But I just, it's just inseparable in, within the music. And it's always been there and always will continue to be there. And um, I just think as long as, you know, we continue to work on giving credit where credit's due in these different fields, I think it's, it's really just about being recognized for your contribution and, you know, being able to, again, pursue the music that moves you and not feel like because you see a certain kind of person being, just because you see a certain kind of person being promoted or a lot of money's being put into them, that they somehow are representative of all people that play the music, which is, you know, the power of media. So the more of us there are, you know, the more people can kind of realize, hey, this is, you know, so, yeah. Awesome. Ms. Layla, how has Af- uh, Black individuals really influenced the country music genre? I mean, uh, country music wouldn't exist without Black people, <laughs> you know? It's like, it's not, uh, I, I don't know if it, we can say, like, how have Black people influenced country music. It's like, country music, it doesn't exist without Black people. Um, and so I think that that begins there. Um, but I, 
I also, you know, um, I just think that, you know, as far as, um, of, uh, you know, as representation, you know, today or how that is helping move uh, tradition forward, we, uh, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, I think that our idea of blackness is that black people are shifting that. We're, we're taking up space in places that did not welcome us previously. Um, and, and it's not about, you know, I need a seat at the table. It's like, actually I built the table, um, you know? And I think that that's, that's the conversation that we're, we're starting to um, have in our society in general. It's like, well, who, yeah, who built the table? And how did this, how did this thing get built? Um, I, I just think that we are all, you know, we have artistic choices about how we incorporate this history and this music into our artistic practice. And, uh, you know, I think all of us are making work that is not just about uh, preservation it's about, um, you know, acknowledging what has come before us. It's about honoring that. And, you know, we can't help but, you know, be, innov be innovators in, in some way because our ears are shaped by our reality. I mean, I grew up listening to the radio in the 90s. How can I not be affected by, by the things that I heard? Um, and how can that not be a part of my conception of music in general? And so, um, yeah, I don't know if that completely answers the question, but that's, uh, that's where I'm coming from with it. All right. And I'll end it with Mr. Don Fleming. Yeah. Well, to, to reference one artist that is on birthright, I'll mention Leslie Riddle and his great version of the Titanic the the song the great ship went down one of the things to think about when it comes to country music and and black people in influencing it and fueling country music is when you think about it think of a song like will the circle be unbroken now if you know that that song comes from the black church tradition it's still a black song even if it's sung by a white person so that's one way to think about it or think of a song like john henry now, there's never been a white John Henry, and that's one thing to really consider when you think of people singing this, those songs, whether they're white or black. They're, they're expressing the struggles and the trials of black people, and so that's something to just consider to start off. Uh, when it comes to Leslie Riddle, sort of, I think of uh, country music and black country music in sort of four tiers. The first one are people like Leslie Riddle, who are African-American musicians who fueled the birth of country music through their songs. And then because they influenced um, people that became famous in country music, they're part of the fuel that makes country music go. With Leslie Riddle, in his case, he was good friends with a guy named Steve Tarter, who was um, Steve Tarter and Henry Gay. They were two musicians who played on the famous Bristol Sessions, which is known as the Big Bang of country music in many, many uh, parts of the country music field. So Tartar and Gay, they had a sporting house, and Leslie Riddle used to hang out with a blues singer named Brownie McGee. And one day, there was a white musician by the name of Alvin Pleasant Carter who met with Leslie. They became friends and traveling companions together. And... Uh, AP would write down the words that he would find in these uh, obscure hollers in Virginia and Tennessee and where, whatnot. And Leslie would remember the melodies that the people that they would meet would sing. And so he, in some ways, is one of the pioneers of country music because of the influence he had on AP's recording group, the original Carter family. And he also helped uh, AP's sister-in-law, um, uh, uh, Maybell Carter with some early guitar licks and so she was able to develop her own style of guitar playing which is one of the foundations of country music as we know it when it comes to lead guitar so that's one piece of it 
you have a second part of it where you have African American performers, uh, people like BB King, Betty Levitt, uh, Solomon Burke, soul artists, and their interpretation of country music material, such as a song by uh, Willie Nelson, for example, just to throw one out there, Nightlife is a great song that B.B. King turned into his own version of uh, country music, which is different than you might hear it in a traditional country music setting. Then, of course, the late, great Charlie Pride is another example of African-American artists who are performing in standard country music style. And, and in some ways, that connects out to uh, Darius Rucker and um, also to Braylon, I believe, in a certain way, it sort of fits within the Charlie Pride vein. And then we have this fourth part of black country music that's coming along, which is an acknowledgement that black country can split off into not just country and Western music, but black people from rural parts of America. And those are two different experiences that are blending together now to become its own type of music. And of course, you got people like Little Nas X or I think um, there's any number of people. And, and of course, Amethyst being from Johnson City, Tennessee, she has a unique experience about what the living and being country means there's just a, there's just a two different ways you can look at um uh, black country so with those sort of four four tiers that's kind of how i look into it a lot of the time and it's it's ever evolving because it's um now we're trying to make sure that it's not just a it's not a lone wolf situation anymore it's it, it is something that is much more comprehensive and i think we're just coming to grips with that in in the united states and in country music in general Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think that, that those are all great points. And, um, and to Ms. McCullough's point, uh, it's a starting point, African-American music and black music in general. And I think it's from those roots, so many branches have been made and it's not specifically to just country. I think we've kind of touched rock music, uh, definitely jazz, and every type of uh, genre of music to the point where it's all well, intermingled at this point. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to go to some fan questions. And we're going to start with a question from Mr. David. Um, first, he thanks everyone on the panel. He says, really appreciate us having this uh, project. So um, his question was this. Which city today is considered today's black music capital? Ooh, gosh, that's, so, a, that, that's a tough one. We're going to start yeah. some fights out here. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans, yeah. obviously. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's where I live. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a tough one. I mean, Chicago is a strong contender mm. as well. Okay, I have a question. I guess uh, so, Atlanta. I think Atlanta would be Atlanta. one possible. Oh, Atlanta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So, so can anyone make the argument for Nashville? Well, in in some ways, yes. Anyone so I'll, can. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I, well, True. I'll, I'll mention, I, I will <laughs> mention that the you know I will mention Fisk University is out there, and that still is a stronghold of, of black mm. music. So there's there is a there's a case to be made in Nashville because there are there are two Nashvilles in many types mm. of ways. So I, there could be a case again, but mm. that's that, I don't know. We will have to get some Nashville people to write write in in the comments to see see what we we get. <laughs> okay, I mean, it does it does it does feel like Nashville is is very um, actively trying to change uh, what the face of, you know, what it represents has been, you know, traditionally. Um, uh, like, just quite literally, you know. Um, there's so many Black, particularly women artists, living in Nashville today who are getting support to create more work um, and to you know, be representative of, of Nashville, which I think, you know, we all kind of like that, just the sound of the word Nashville conjures a certain kind of image that is not necessarily a black woman with a acoustic guitar or something, you know, or a banjo. But, um, you know, I've, I, I feel like um, there's a lot of 
kind of advocacy um, happening for black music um, in the Americana folk realm that feels new. Um, would I say that that makes it the center of black music in America? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, you know, I just don't believe in that kind of thinking to tell you the truth. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think that we, <clears throat> there's black people everywhere in the world. Um, there are black people all over this country, innovating, making interesting music, trying out different sounds and different things, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're coming a, a, kind of this to this as like folkies, but um, th that is just one small part of, of black music too, you know? And so, you know, just like people like to say, you know, the birthplace of jazz is New Orleans. Jazz was born everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Jazz was born everywhere in, in the South. And it wasn't, you know, there, it isn't just this one moment where it's like the birth of jazz happened. It's like, it's still happening. It's still being born. It's still dying. <laughs> and we're still recreating yeah. the, the, the tradition. So I, I think that the, um, you know, if I can be so bold, I think the question is, is flawed. <laughs> So I yeah, agree I, with I, you completely. I agree with, I agree with yeah, 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 yeah. That's a very good point. So I agree. I want to make a point no, uh, about Miss Amethyst, it, actually. But... <laughs> yeah. We love you, David. Miss yeah. so, <laughs> <yeah, yeah. laughs> <laughs> Amethyst, I want to give you credit because, like, uh, yeah. so I had a discussion recently with the young man that works at a record label, and then we were talking about New York being the capital of music, especially underground music. I was like, I don't necessarily know if that's true because uh, cost of living in majority of major cities in the United States is so like high. It's hard for a lot of artists to even live in a lot of cities like New York, San Francisco, uh, Austin, Texas. I mean, a lot of people so are I leaving. Think a lot of people mm -hmm. are leaving. And I think it's those small yeah. communities like uh, Asheville, um, North Carolina, uh, yeah. Johnson City, like these small places where people can work and live but also be artists at the same time so i think voices yeah. like yours in unique areas that's important yeah i mean i think you know when it comes to you know places like nashville new york city la like for me it, it was i know that these are still the epicenters where a lot of like labels are still established whether they be major or independent and I very seriously considered moving to Nashville once I got my label deal with Rounder. Um, but then there was, a, there was a year where certain things happened where we couldn't really go to a lot of different places. Um, and so it, and once I was able to start moving around again, like in 2021, and I was going back and forth to Nashville, I started to realize that like, I want a nice big open space to kind of stretch out when I come back home. Um, I don't have to go find a retreat to go riding. I can literally just come to my studio or I can be at home, have a nice quiet space. I don't have to worry about, you know, parking or, you know, being able to, you know, pay, no, be able to pay my rent. Like, you know, I'm in an area where everything just makes sense. And if I need, to record or communicate or do anything, there's a lot of things you can do remotely. You can plan a trip to meet people and then go back home. Like it's, it's just, it's just easier to get around. And so a lot of people are just like, well, why am I, why am I still here when I can, you know, be somewhere else, have, you know, have maybe like have a, have a yard, you know, have, you know, have space. So, so yeah, I think it's, um, I think, Again, these institutions are still in these bigger cities, but as far as the artists are concerned, it's kind of like you really can kind of be anywhere and still make amazing music. Um, a lot of people, there's, there's even here, there's like, there's like studios and there's you know places where people can record. Asheville has um, Echo Mountain. Um, you know, that's a studio that a lot of people have come to record. So it's just there's a lot more <coughs> options now. Um, you know. Also recording, making a home studio, like equipment is so much cheaper now than it used to be. So there's just a lot more flexibility. Um, so it's an exciting time to, to be an artist and have all these different options at your disposal. To being 
having to have a record deal in order to, you know, make music and stuff. So it's, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we have two more questions. Um, so the first question has to go back with the blending of genres. Uh, they mm -hmm. ask specifically, how does that help us move forward with preserving tradition while creating new perspectives? And I'll throw that to anyone. I mean, hmm. one I mean, thing I can, what, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Amethyst. No, I was just going to say, what was the, the question again? Because I was reading it, but I missed it. Oh, yeah, if we could scroll back. <laughs> Go up a little bit. So the question was... Okay. Yeah. So with the blending of genres, how does that help us move forward with preserving tradition while creating new perspectives? Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, well, one thing that I've noticed is well, when it comes to access, now, if you can imagine that if no one or many people aren't aware of, of say, an old-timey style, one of the ways that I've been able to blend things together, like I mentioned with Polly Put the Kettle On, that was a song that was a song that was in English children's music. It then was adapted at one point or another, however many years, decades afterward, into a blues style, and then I changed it into a string band style of music i'm able to show the different ways that a good song can continue to be a good song but then also it can have a completely different rhythm it can have a different tempo and the instruments can change uh, in in very vastly different ways to showcase the way that i myself as a modern artist want to interpret and present the material to my audience and so that in of itself is one way that you can create a new perspective because many times people will say, well, this music's a little bit old, so I'm not sure exactly why it's very relevant. Now, if you know that someone might take that sort of position as an artist, uh, one of the things I like to do is I try to rearrange songs and I try to make them seem interesting so that the songs never seem like they're old songs, but they are more timeless. And that's one thing that I've always tried to do in my own uh, music. And that's one of the ways that you can go about it. Sometimes you can also blend genres as well. You know, there have been times where I blended, um, like on my more most recent record, Traveling Wildfire, I blend a lot of um, electric guitar styles that I have um, that link back to my love of surf music, love of 60s music, and I, and I put it together with acoustic music that is more in line with my love of singer-songwriters uh, and, and all of that. So there are different ways you can bring new perspectives so that when the music comes out of the speaker and gets to the audience's ears, they're able to hear something brand new that if they may have a, a uh, pre-existing uh, judgment over the music, they might be able to, it might be able to open their minds into something brand new. I think that we're um, living in a time that is uh, asking us to reflect on our experiences um, and how we contribute to uh, different conversations that we're having in our society. Um, I think we're being called to that all as artists, you know, um, whether, whether we're realizing that or not. Maybe, our, maybe that is the role of artists, you know, is to reckon with that. Um, and so, uh, like I said earlier, our, we've absorbed the sounds of our, our generation. And so even when you love traditional music and you're looking back and, you know, wanting to learn things from it, I think it's inevitable that that kind of can come through unless you're, you know, attempting to make a, a more museum piece, you know, recording. But I think that uh, there's a lot of kind of um, stepping away from that. I think we're being asked to um, incorporate our own personalities and experiences more into the music. And so that, that you can't help but arrive at a new perspective. Um, I think that that's just part of the, the cycle, you know, of, um, of being an artist is like realizing um, that there is uh, 
that that is maybe the work, you know, that that's the work of, of our times. Yeah, I think for me, the, I think a big, I think for me, like, like the three finger style playing that I learned, learning old time music, that, and also the um, old time backup rhythm guitar, both of those styles are things that I continue to use in my, in my own music. A lot of the melodies um, are inspired by the songs that I learned. So, um, so yeah, it's always, now that it's permanently become fused within me. And so anything that I create, um, that's always gonna live on whether I am doing an actual traditional song or whether it's an original song. I mean, it's, it's really, really helped shape my songwriting. So, um, and it's something that, you know, I always try to bring up when we're talking about it is, um, you know, those, you know, learning those, learning those styles is just, again, forever changed, you know, how I, how I make music. So, um, so yeah, I think for me, it's really about moving forward, just always. And also I have ideas and plans to like moving forward to always either, whether it's in my set or on a recording, still play, um, an interpretation of a, of an old time song because I feel like it's always going to be important to point back to whoever's a new person, a new listener. Um, I can be like, Hey, this is a huge part of what I do. Maybe go check some of that stuff out too, you know, um, and try to share the love and the, and the history of it. So, so yeah, that's kind of my way. I want to continue to try to do that. So. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to end it with this question right here. And this was the last uh, submission. So what are each of you doing next in your own work? And what are you looking forward to? We'll start with Ms. Layla McCullough. Um, I have been doing a lot of, um, you know, I've done a lot of projects that are kind of about the past, um, my last project is called Breaking the Thermometer, and it's an exploration of a lot of research that I did at an archive um, of Radio Haiti and the stories of these very brave uh, journalists who put their lives on the line to be able to tell the truth and, and fight for freedom of speech in Haiti in the you know, 70s and 80s and 90s. And, um, and it's brought me to this place of being really more curious about asking questions about the future. Um, and so I've been looking to um, mostly women, Afrofuturist writers, um, and doing a lot of reading and songwriting based on the things that I'm absorbing from those uh, philosophical sort of teachings. And we'll probably make another record <laughs> from that. <laughs> Okay, Miss Amethyskia. Well, right now, um, and for the past like several months, I've been um, just really diving headlong into continuing to grow and learn as a songwriter. Um, uh, it's it's been really amazing to be able to now actually carve out time to just. Especially, I think, during the early part of 2022 and the early part of this year to just have days where I go to the studio and I'm just working on songs. Um, that's been that's what I have always wanted to do. I took a break from that to focus on um, learning folk songs and and just really like absorbing that history. Um, and now you know, I, I, I'm kind of coming back to, um, to, to writing songs and still incorporating those things that I've learned within my songs. So, so I'm still doing that. And a lot of the songs I've actually been doing a lot of, um, a lot of the songs now I'm really able to kind of focus on like my observations and the things around me. Um, whereas the first record, was a lot of me just like dealing with 
my personal stuff and how it's gotten in the way of me being able to like really like self-actualize. Um, and I kind of say that with air quotes because you're, I feel like you're always kind of growing as a person and finding new things out about yourself. So there's not, there's never going to be this finite thing of like, you know, I figured it all out, but now that I've been able to move past that stuff, and a lot of the songs that I used to write were based off of my emotional turmoil. And now that I don't have that happening as nearly as often, and I'm generally like, things are generally pretty good. It's like, okay, well now, what do I write about, <laughs> you know? So having to kind of rediscover new ways to write songs has been, uh, has been really amazing. And it's been great to finally write songs and not have it be so intense and like, and heart wrenching. It's just like, now it's like, I'm just enjoying it. So a lot of that joy will be, I think, reflected in uh, once I go back in the studio and record these new songs. So, so yeah, just a lot more songwriting and yeah, it's fun. <laughs> awesome. And we'll end it with Mr. Don Fleming. Well, uh, I will say that uh, next in my work, I just did release a brand new record, Traveling Wildfire, on the 24th of March. So that's brand new. And with that one, nice. I wanted to break it. You know, I, I wanted to break it down in a couple of ways. Um, you know, I wanted to jump into the country music conversation a little bit. So I brought out a few uh, songs that I had written in the country music style. One of them is a real old one that goes back to 2008 called Slow Dance with You. But then I was able to write a few more that that take me up to the present. I also you know, wanted to go back into uh, my love of the Black West. Uh, my previous album, Black Cowboys, was inspired. Uh, it inspired a couple of tracks on on the new record, and then also reaching back into some of the old time music people know. So on the front end, it's more country and western, and then on the back end, I go into some of the the old time folk styles, sort of like I've done before, but found some new material, found some different stuff from the Library of Congress, and also from uh, spending time with my friends uh, that also collect records and, and getting some new material that way. So that's something I have going on there when it comes to my personal artistic, uh, you know, what's next and what am I looking forward to. But I would be amiss if I did mention WSM and, and uh, my show, The American Songster Radio, where I'm getting a chance to present uh, first um, interviews with friends that um, I've gotten to know over the years and getting to break down into some of the, the deeper conversations about what roots music mean to them and what, um, uh, what are some of the deeper stories that we can find out when we just kind of break through the artifice of what's your new record and how are you doing and so that's one thing. And then this season, we're focusing on Traveling Wildfire, where I'm playing different songs that have changed my life from my record collection. So that's kind of a, the other part of my trajectory. And then, of course, writing essays like the one I wrote for Birthright, um, those are, those, uh, that's another aspect of my own love, because um, when I went to college, I got a BA in English, so I learned how to, learned how to write things critically. And so as I go along, just being able to write more critical essays that are talking about where we've come and where we're going in the music. That's also something that really gets me thinking about the future often. Um, you know, when you're doing a record, it fe it's always feels very present to you. Um, but when writing an essay, you're sort of writing for someone who might read it 50 years in the future or a hundred years in the future. So you're always trying to think of the, trying to think of what's going to be happening after you've written your essay. So, that's uh, been another part of my, um, my uh, I guess, activities as a musician. So those, those three have been what I've been really going for. Awesome. Well, yeah, so that seems like the conclusion of this roundtable discussion. I just want to thank each one of you for your amazing contributions to this uh, amazing project. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, Ms. Amethyst, uh, Ms. Layla, and also um, just thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having this good conversation. No thank yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sweet.